Thank you very much, Piotr. Uh, it's great to be here. I'm very honored to be uh, to be here in Astana talking to you all. Um, thank you for inviting me. So uh, to expand a bit on what I do, I'm relatively new to library world here. Uh, I hold a multidisciplinary PhD in the social sciences and consider myself a digital anthropologist by academic background. Part of my academic interests include how people use global technologies locally. Well, globally, we share networks and use technologies like books and eBooks. People use them uniquely in their own ways. At IFLA, I work with the Copyright and Legal Matters Committee, uh, connecting other experts around the world on issues of copyright, digital publications, and open access. I also work with our FAFE Committee on freedom of access to information and expression. Part of my work is research, part is advice, and part is advocacy in international forums. Um, notably, the World Intellectual Property Organization's Standing Committee on Copyright and Related Rights, which meets in Geneva. That's WIPO SCCR for short. Uh, we want to promote copyright laws and collect and access policies that enable libraries to collect, store, preserve, and share content, which is what I'll be talking about today. Uh, this is also to say that uh, as an anthropologist, I'm used to exploring local views, but in my own position at IFLA, uh, this perhaps offers a big picture global view. Uh, an example of the big picture view that we do well uh, is something here that my colleagues have been involved with. This is the library map of the world, which is available online. If you search for it, you'll find it. Uh, which offers, which aggregates statistics about libraries on a country level and ties them to UN sustainable development goals and also collects stories about them. Uh, here we see Kazakhstan. Uh, if you look at the map, you can see how many libraries over here are in the country and imagine the values that they bring to their communities. Um, this is also to say that you may or may not see your experiences reflected in what I talk about today. And if you do, it shows that other libraries around the world are facing similar challenges. And if not, this is an opportunity to speak to me because uh, I'm not just here to talk, but to understand more about your experiences with your libraries and the challenges you're facing with copyright and open access. Uh, this is also to say before others on this panel move into more open access oriented directions, I'm gonna be a bit more traditional and talk about copyright and copyright law. And what I want to do with this, uh, explore this big picture uh, view of the recent past and future of digital access uh, to talk about, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic, our recent major worldwide event, which was not a catalyst, but an event that revealed ongoing trends in digital access and accelerated the urgency of addressing them. The pandemic was a flashpoint for the challenges libraries will face in the future as they seek to provide access to digital content. For libraries, with physical collections closed, books difficult to distribute, and social distancing measures in effect, the pandemic accelerated the impetus to provide access to collections digitally. I explored this through a report I wrote in April 2022, which Piotr also mentioned, um, on libraries' experiences with COVID during, copyright during COVID. Uh, we received 114 survey responses. I conducted 28 interviews and altogether people were represented from 29 countries. Uh, moving to digital during COVID firstly meant libraries could not as easily provide technological infrastructures. Libraries could not serve as in-person physical community spaces even as many developed innovative ways to continue uh, providing services like children's storytelling online and sharing information, uh, digitizing books. They could not necessarily provide computers and internet access, however, and thus people's ability to access digital content uh, became dependent on their own IT. Uh, to use an example um, from my own home, I'm from very rural agricultural part of America. A friend of mine was teaching in a town about 25,000 people. Uh, many of his students are international, they're migrants, they've come to the town for the agriculture and meat packing industries. Um, they're not very wealthy and many did not have internet at home. So as the schools began shifting towards, we need to teach online, 
Um, they had to find a way to provision internet access for that. There was internet available, and they at first, uh, at first, the internet service providers provided a data capped version of the internet uh, just for classroom use to students who had just returned home for the pandemic. Uh, this went about as well as you, you might expect. Uh, you can't tell a bunch of students that you're only going to use this, uh, this internet uh, for schoolwork. So the ISP had to relent. It had to, uh, had to uncap that. Um, and this is a place where the internet is good, but people just had to, had to get the access. The challenge was provisioning it. Uh, things are much more difficult in places where internet connections were not reliable, and those issues remain in place. Um, however, even if internet is in place, libraries face challenges related to copyright and licensing. They could not provide the material on site. They could not necessarily send articles to institutionally unaffiliated patrons who would have previously been served as walk-ins. Licenses limited by country pose challenges for universities whose international students and faculties return to their home countries. Put simply, even if books existed, licensing restrictions and digital rights management put the capacity to use them in doubt. Um, as our report described, again, 114 responses, 29 countries, 83% of people said that they had, of library professionals, said they had copyright related challenges uh, during, due to facility closures during the pandemic. We saw questions around the world concerning whether content could be used on site in libraries or as that would in in-person classrooms. Could it be legally used online as you would have um, online, online if you'd used it in the classroom for a similar person? It was unclear if educational copyright exceptions covered online use and uh, sometimes digital rights management aspects of platforms stop the use of audiovisual content altogether, even if it was legal to use it. Now, publishers partially mitigated pandemic-related closures by offering expanded access to journals, eBooks, and other contents during the first few months of the pandemic. However, this was an extraordinarily chaotic period as libraries uh, struggled to find out what were the workable solutions to do, uh, to do for the time being. And by the time the new normal was in place, the offers had ended. Libraries further ran up against ongoing challenges that only a fraction of published books are available as eBooks. eBook licenses are expensive for libraries, more so than they are for private consumers. And a physical book can be purchased, owned, and lent. However, eBooks are typically licensed for a period or number of uses at rates that are exponentially higher than indefinite period of li licenses available to private consumers. They are also sometimes blocked from acquiring and lending digital textbooks, transferring responsibility onto students to pay for content. So in these cases, beyond infrastructural challenges, digital content faced barriers due to copyright licensing and other human-made technical challenges designed to restrict the flow of information. Uh, this in some ways runs contrary to the spirit of copyright law, which has one part historically concerned protecting the rights of rights holders, but in another aspect of it has uh, protected the rights of users, researchers, and consumers uh, to promote social benefits, including education and scientific knowledge. Uh, this goes back to the 1710 Statute of Anne in England, uh, and the U.S. Constitution grants the right to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. The key words here are for limited times. Copyright places limits on right holders' rights because the public has rights too. These are limitations and exceptions to copyright law rights to quotation, to copy, parody, transformative use, to create a public domain so that new creators might build on existing works. It places limits on the length of time that you might exclusively have the right to copy work. In the US, this is 70 years after the death of the author, and due to American influence, this has become the international standard. These limits, uh, these limits on uses after the literal death of the author also protect the figurative death of the author. Uh, to quote the title from Roland Barthes' influential 1967 essay, 
That is, they enable readers and creators the rights to make new readings of text beyond what their creators may have envisioned. And this is the double-edged sword of a developed expansive copyright system. They tend to have expansive rights for rights holders and broad limitations and exceptions for use. Many countries, however, have written into law the rights holder half, but they have not necessarily developed reasonable limitations and exceptions. Uh, human rights and other legal protections or obligations may supersede copyright law. The most well-known recent success in this area is the Marrakesh Treaty from 2013 for individuals with print disabilities, which enables the production of materials for the visually impaired and the coordination of access uh, to provide this work uh, available in ways that would be difficult to provide commercially. At WIPO SCCR lately, a consortium of African countries have led the way in promoting instruments and toolkits for countries to develop up-to-date limitations, limitations and exceptions to copyright. Uh, if you're further interested in this topic, uh, IFLA has recently produced and published a guide on copyright for libraries. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about copyright for your institution, if you're interested in political advocacy, uh, this is available in hardcover. It's also available open access through the DeGrouter website and through the IFLA repository. So if you search online to find this, you will find it. It's 570 pages, 20 chapters, and a tremendous resource. Likewise, uh, IFLA has produced several recent statements in support of open access and related movements. Uh, what uh, everything I've said about copyright underscores the impetus and the reasons for open access and for multiple channels to access content. Uh, these statements are in part intended for, uh, um, for you to get up to speed if, if you need to get up to speed and also as an advocacy tool so that you have talking points. So you have things that you can discuss as you promote open access at your institutions and uh, in other venues. Also, on a practical in-library level, a great place to start is also Spark Europe's open educational resources. Um, again, search online and you'll find this. Uh, there's a tremendous amount there about getting into OER. So, uh, so back to the uh, back to the challenges wrought by the digital age and the shift towards uh, not necessarily owning and licensing content, but paying for subscriptions. Uh, firstly, eBooks. As mentioned, libraries are not offered access on comparable terms to consumers, and are often offered access under license. Uh, but the catalogs they are they have access to shift and change. Uh, this month, October 2022. Wiley removed 1,300 textbooks from its digital catalogs and only reinstated them temporarily after pressure. The removals came just as the term was starting and forced librarians and educators to quickly reconfigure their courses when the available materials suddenly weren't available, then reconfigure them again when they became available. Uh, in 2020, the ebook platform Dawson ERA ended service. And uh, these contracts would have gone unfulfilled had other platforms not hosted its content, particularly French language content. And that might have been lost had that migration not occurred. Now, in several US states, laws have been passed that sought to compel publishers to provide ebook licenses to libraries at reasonable rates. These have been challenged in the courts, and at least one state case been declared unconstitutional. In response to the lack of available digital content, some libraries have also embraced digitization projects, sometimes under the heading of controlled digital lending or CDL. They have either digitized their own collections or worked with digitized collections of other institutions, locking their physical collections and lending out copies on a one-to-one -one basis. From the library perspective, it's an extension of established practice making legitimately acquired collections available. These include the Haffey Trust and also the Internet Archives Emergency Library, uh, which is currently facing a lawsuit from publishers with many amicus briefs filed on the sides, both sides on this. Um, the library, the Internet Archive in this case, has also received uh, tremendous support from authors. Um, and these things are currently, um, well, a third example as well, of course, is SciHub, 
uh, which disregards copyright entirely and was developed by a Kazakh student. Uh, if content is unavailable, it is unsurprising that people will develop localized workarounds. Um, how these practices, legal cases and challenges sort out will shape digital, will shape libraries relationships to eBooks and digital content in the future, including their capacity to acquire and retain content. These different approaches underscore the extent that there is no single model for licensing and that there are many access problems. Many access problems are socio-technical. People are working out there, working this out on their own, often in legal gray areas and where norms, laws, and standards go in part depend on our actions. Um, I also want to highlight the work here. This is from some researchers out of uh, American University in Washington, and it is a very broad overview of exceptions for text and data mining, which requires the copying of large amounts of content into machine readable databases. Uh, I didn't necessarily want to go into the specifics on this, but this does give a sense that around the world, uh, different countries are developing uh, different levels of access and different levels of exception. Here, uh, the green has the broadest exceptions, uh, the red has the most restrictions on that. Uh, it also gets a bit down here on what kinds of restrictions are offered. But uh, uh, again, this underscores that there's not necessarily, if you're interested in the specifics of this research, this is all open access. It's all available online. And uh, it, it does show that different countries are addressing this in different ways and different options will be available in different countries. Um, so yeah, uh, in conclusion, I, I, I love opening books, I love physical books. And in the future, I hope physical collections continue to play a key role in libraries activities. Uh, books are still easy to read and distribute and digital technologies can be challenging to acquire and maintain. However, digital access will remain a key part of the future of libraries and law and policy must proactively keep pace with the longstanding historic purposes of copyright, not just to restrict publications uh, for rights holders, but to make them available for people to use. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone, and thank you, first of all, for having me in this great conference in uh, Astana in Kazakhstan. I'm very happy to share with you some of the work that we do, we do in the NOL, which is the European Network of Open Education Librarians. And uh, I'm very happy that uh, you have been uh, interested in uh, knowing more about us, about our work. And most of all, I'm grateful for the work that uh, the library that is organizing this conference did to localize one of our tools. But uh, let's dive into what we do and discover together why, for example, I chose this image to start this presentation with a, a human tower built by many people and uh, in which each single member counts, not only the people that are building the tower and that uh, are somehow more visible, but uh, all of them, all of the people on the basis of the tower, helping others to keep straight ahead and continue adding more people and involving more people in the picture. So, Let's see. Let's start from uh, the defini small definitions of openness. When we talk about open education, the main word uh, is open because education, I'm sure that all of you already know what it is. Um, and uh, when we talk about open education, the first step is to understand that open is different from free. Uh, open is not only free. Open is free plus permissions. What does this mean? It means that uh, if I am an author of an educational resource and I want others to reuse it, the best option for me is to add a permission to this uh, uh, educational resource that I created and uh, use this permission to, to tell others what they can do with my uh, resource. And uh, they don't even have to reach out to me uh, again, because in the permission, in the license that I add to my resource, everything is already stated. All the things, single things that they can do with my resource are explicitly stated. 
Let's uh, dive into this. What are open educational resources? Starting directly from the UNESCO ER recommendation, um, which is uh, the main document that we rely on nowadays, and it was released in 2019 by UNESCO, and it was presented in Milan. Actually, it, it's my university. Uh, we had the Open Education Global Conference, and uh, the announcement was done during our conference there. Uh, the UNESCO year recommendation states that uh, open licenses respect the intellectual property rights of the copyright owner and provide permissions granting the public the rights to access, reuse, repurpose, adapt and redistribute educational materials. This is very important because this is a very basic um, concept if you think about it, but uh, knowing more about open licenses helps uh, all people involved in education to better understand the power they have in their end when choosing which resource to share and which resource to reuse, and maybe why not adapt. One of the symbols of the licenses is, is uh, at the bottom left of this slide. In this case, it is a CC BY, and in the middle of the footer, you see that uh, this license is a derivative of a tool that the DNOL created itself. And uh, you will discover more uh, going through the links that I'm sharing with this, uh, um, uh, with this presentation. Uh, when we talk about open education, we specifically uh, work on uh, sustainable development goal number four, which, which uh, states that uh, quality education is a right for all. And uh, uh, open education does exactly this. It allows everyone to share their resources freely and allowing them to reuse them um, for their educational purposes. So just to give you a very high level overview of all the licenses that we can have, this is an image that uh, summarizes all the Creative Commons licenses. And uh, there are six, op six options available from the um, highest level of freedom till uh, the narrowest uh, level of freedom uh, provided from the author to the reusers. Uh, you might want to get familiar with those licenses, and if you need my help, I'm more than happy to, to be available for that. And um, as you will see, there are different levels of freedom when you go through uh, one license to the other. But most of all, I want to focus your attention on the fir first uh, licenses that are CC BY, which means uh, that uh, you have to state the when you reuse a resource, you have to state who was the author. And then you have CC BY SA, which not only asks you to uh, reuse a resource, stating who was the, the, the original author of it, but also to share it with the same license. And again, we have CC BY NC, which means that you have to state uh, the author and also not to reuse this resource for a commercial purpose. NC stay, stays for non-commercial. And then we have CC BY NCSA, which is the last license that applies to open educational resources. This license means that you have to state uh, the author by, uh, that you, uh, you can reuse the resource uh, not for commercial purposes, NC, and that you have to uh, release your new resource, the derivative resource that comes from the original one with the same license which is share like SA. You see that we have different degrees of freedom from the maximum level of freedom till the minimum. The last two licenses that are ND, ND means non-derivative, are not OER because they don't allow reusers to adapt the resources and share them again. They can retain them, which means that if you find a resource, for example, I share with you a presentation and it is released with the NNC license, you can for sure reuse it, but you have to, sorry, you can for sure, um, let's say, uh, reuse it yourself privately, but then you have to somehow uh, uh, retain it just for yourself, okay? You can't redistribute it. Um, how can you use reuse OERs? Uh, you can make copies 
of it, and uh, this, uh, this is uh, stated as retain. You can uh, reuse them in many ways. It is the second R, reuse. You can adapt, modify, and improve them according to your own educational goals, revise, and you can combine two or more of them yourself uh, using your resources or others, other other authors' resources with compatible licenses. And there are many tools that, if you are interested, we can look at together later on today or in another in another uh, occasion to understand how properly remix uh, different resources together. And most of all, you can redistribute them, which means that you are allowed to share resources with others. Those are called the five R's of OER. Uh, those five R's, uh, re retain, reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute, allow open educational resources, help you in uh, uh, sharing knowledge at most, and your students to reuse resources without uh, um, high, high expenditure, high level of costs. Uh, just look at this uh, example um, to see what does it mean to remix. So you see, this is me, and this is a portrait uh, uh, done for, uh, for me starting from a photo that I shared in a conference, and it is re released by Chrissy Neranzi. Chrissy is a colleague that uh, lives and works in the uh, UK. She's from Greece. And uh, she used, in order to create the, the doll on the right side of the slide, she reused her own OER, which is uh, my portrait, together with the address. It is a small statue, actually, coming from the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. This photo was, is released by the Rijksmuseum with a CC0 license, which means that everyone can do whatever they want with, with, with this image of this uh, small statue. And this is what Chrissy did. She created a remix between uh, the original image of the statue from the Rijksmuseum together with uh, the portrait that she created of me. And I'm very happy to share this as, a, as a, an example. This is the original picture that you can download yourself from Rijksmuseum if you want. They have uh, the, their whole collection shared with an open license, which means that every student can reuse the resources of the museum to study, to create derivative resources, and their teachers too can reuse those resources to explain art or to um, ignite creative and active uh, learning in the classrooms. Uh, I quoted uh, I mean, some minutes before the UNESCO year recommendation. The UNESCO year recommendation released in 2019 focuses on five action areas that we are all invited to implement. The focus of UNESCO here is to increase the number of people worldwide that use open educational resources in order to make uh, education available for all, which is, as you immediately understand, completely consistent with SDG number four, quality education for all. The UNESCO year recommendation focused on five action areas. The first of all is building capacity of stakeholders to create, access, use, adapt, and redistribute OER. You might recognize some of the language that I used a, my, a moment ago in this one. And we, as the European Network of Open Educational Resources, uh, open Educational Librarians, sorry, are doing our best to implement this action area in all we do. The second action area is developing supportive policy, policy which means that uh, at, at the local, regional, national, and international level, we need the policies that allows and encourage users, teachers, and all stakeholders involved to release their educational resources with an open license. And, talks also about strategies, about how to make these recognizable, how these can inc be increased with the uh, fundings or with op project opportunities. So it's very important that we continue our work on supportive policies. And this is what we do as the NOL2. The third action area states encouraging inclusive and equitable quality OER. 
uh, which means that we not only want to release uh, educational resources, but we want them also to be high level of quality. The fourth is nurturing the creation of sustainable models of OER, because uh, creating OER costs as simple as that. So we need fundings and we need strategies to make this sustainable. Otherwise, it's not going to happen that we are able to make open the default. And this is actually what we want to achieve. Um, and we are very motivated. So we have to continue finding the sustainable models. The fifth and last action area is uh, about facilitating international cooperation. And look what we are doing today. <laughs> I've been working at the international level to increase uh, the advancement of, OE, of open education uh, in my daily life. And I'm very happy that you are jumping on board to help us all at the global level increase the, the implementation of those action areas. And I'm sharing the link with you to directly to the UNESCO year recommendation so you can maybe have a look at it in details. Why librarians are perfect for open education? Why are we working with librarians? I am not a librarian myself, you know, I'm just the open education community manager at uh, uh, Spark Europe, supporting librarians to, to do their best. And I'm also working part-time in Politecnico di Milano, uh, the university that we have here in Italy. Uh, and uh, also there, I am an advocate for open education and uh, I am doing my best to increase the release of open educational resources there. Why librarians? I'm not a librarian, I was saying, but librarians are key for open education. The skills set you have is not shared with all the other stakeholders involved. So it's very important that you as librarians are helping out. Often they are seen as trusted partners in institutions, but they are also very service oriented, which is key to support the students, teachers, researchers implementing new open educational resources. They are also very able at facilitating access to knowledge and they are also uh, able to be role changers. They come from buyers, they become creators, they are able to be curators, publishers, legal advisors, knowledge disseminators, etc. And many already provide leadership in open science. Some already provide the learning support and they are also very keen to collaborate with other departments. So what do we do in NOL as librarians? First of all, we work together. We meet monthly, we record the meetings and we collaboratively take notes so that the notes are everyone's notes. And uh, we are very practical in what we do. Our agenda usually is a list of activities, activities and outputs that we want to release within a short time uh, schedule. In NOL, we share. Members are willing to share experiences and ask for support from their peers beyond the activities that we do as the NOL. For example, uh, we are recording each every two months uh, a, a webinar with uh, one of our members sharing their experience, we call them under the spotlight, so that other members can know uh, them better, but they also can uh, learn from their work and uh, implement something, adapting it to their own library needs and their own institutional needs. And in annual, we collaborate. We work in subgroups with different goals and different levels, and we meet uh, mm, uh, both the strategic and practical needs with these meeting uh, and from time to time. I'm very happy now to share with you that we just won uh, two days ago um, on the 20th of October, and uh, I'm re recording this in advance, of course, uh, the Open Education, the Open Collaboration uh, 2022 Award uh, from the Open Education Global, which is the uh, the organization that globally supports open education. And uh, this is a very nice uh, recognition of the work that we do, so I'm grateful to have it. In this page, th this is our Wakelet page, not, not making this story too long for you. I'm leaving you with this link, which is great for you if you want to reach out and learn more about our work, because on top of our website page, which is also linked in the slides. This Wakelet page 
collects all our resources, the resources that we create, the resources that we share in different channels, including a YouTube channel where, where we record all our webinars, and the resources that we find in the web and that we, uh, we think that it might be useful for other librarians who want to know more about open education. So uh, please go ahead, reuse and adapt your our resources. You are welcome to do that. Remember that open means free plus permission, and we are giving everybody the permission to reuse our resources because they are shared all always with an open license that is a CC BY, the most open one. Uh, and since collaboration comes with challenges, but and one of the challenges is not having a lot of time, now I know that my time is over. So if you want to know more about our challenges, go ahead and uh, dive into the challenges that we are facing uh, reading this slide afterwards. And remember that we are collaborating with different organizations worldwide. So if you want to collaborate with us, we are happy to do that. And uh, thank you. This last slide, as a different tower. So the message is, in every place on Earth, humans can build towers that are uh, different, but useful, beautiful, and better than uh, their previous experiences if they learn from each other. Thanks again for having me, and uh, see you next time. Bye. Thank you, Peter. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Ray Uswishin. I am Director of Collections and Digital Services for Texas State University Libraries out of the United States. And I will be talking to you this morning about the technological aspects of open access. And this, my talk dovetails very nicely with the other two speakers because it's very different. And I'm going to be focusing on open access libraries, and specifically today, data research repositories. This is the open science uh, research aspect that the provost was mentioning. And tomorrow, I'm going to be focusing on more the cultural heritage and taking a deeper dive into research ecosystems, open access research ecosystems. And tonight, today, I wanted to inspire you a little bit in terms of what's going on in terms of open access artificial intelligence and discovery, because it's really exciting in terms of um, the possibilities really for libraries and to, for libraries to be part of this process. So if anybody has been following computer science in the last five years, the last five years has really shown incredible progress in analytical computation tools. And that's particularly artificial intelligence. It's really the hot new kid on the block. Everybody's talking about AI, machine learning, deep learning, neural networks, and what could be done and what is being done very pragmatically. Libraries too have a key role to play within this process. And I'm gonna go over some of the key roles that we already are doing and that we have the possibility of very, very easily uh, implementing. And those today will focus on the online research uh, data repository and some other tools that we already have. So I want to take a step back and the topic of the conference is open access. And I wanted to say, ask the question, what are the general common characteristics of a data repository and open access digital scholarship ecosystem? Well, of course, it uses open source software. Open source software means it's not developed by a corporation, so there has to be active developer communities. And you also want those components to be able to talk with each other. And because of that, they have to be open so they can be customized. So the Dataverse can talk to the online institutional repository and the online institutional repository can be connected to the electronic thesis and dissertation management system and uh, other connections. Together, these e digital ecosystem components really enable the academic 
research cycle. And this has to do also with the provo what the provost uh, was saying. Just to abstract this in terms of the big picture here, on abstract levels, the academic research cycle, and this is very important for universities, has to do with, from the right, the creation of knowledge, the quality assurance of knowledge, the dissemination of knowledge, and the identification of knowledge. And all of these aspects involve libraries and collaboration. On pragmatic levels that we talk about every day in libraries, this has to do with discovery, search and retrieval, the gathering and analysis of research and open access um, artifacts. And that means cataloging and metadata application the writing and publishing of open access uh, books. And that involves a lot of our applications from open access institutional repositories to the data repository possibilities. I'm gonna be talking to you about uh, today. That data repository also results in wider global sharing and impact of research. And that's really where it becomes super important in terms of actually having one of these. So I want to begin again here with the question, what is an online research data repository to kind of simplify the question? Well, it's a way to share, publish, and archive your data. So what that means essentially is the data is open and it's online for anybody to use. So you, you're able to find and cite data across all research uh, fields. Now I put a map of Texas here on the left. It's about, it's a big state. There's about 30 million people. I saw Kazakhstan has about 19 million people. Now I put this on here because in Texas, we did a consortial repository in between all of the universities, uh, 44 universities. Kazakhstan has the possibility and the Eurasian Library Association has the possibility of doing a single closed universe, university data repository, a larger Kazakhstan wide open access uh, digital uh, data repository or a whole European, um, a whole Eurasian uh, data repository. The advantage of this has to do with the sharing of data, sharing internally within the university, sharing um, externally with your colleagues at other universities, say in Kazakhstan or other Eurasian universities which might have similar research that can be quickly aggregated if you have the data repository. So going a little further into further specifics, it's the data repository is a platform to manage researcher and institutions data and mat, uh, metadata. It's a permalinking strategy for uh, data citation. It's a way to manage open access funder compliance because a lot of international funders these days say, if you're going to get a grant from us and we're a big international funding uh, um, organization, you need to make your data public. And there needs to be that aspect of transparency uh, involved. And also importantly, it's a very, very important data archiving and sharing strategy in the 21st century. My feelings about data repositories, and I'm giving you kind of a whirlwind tour of the data repositories, and I'll be focusing tomorrow on where I think data repositories should be placed. And that's within a bigger ecosystem that I call the digital scholarship research ecosystem, which is an open access um, ecosystem, which com composes of, which is composed of two components, content, subject content, and that could be something like text. And we use a digital collections repository or institutional repository for, for that or research data. And, and that's what the focus is today. Beyond that, there's also tertiary components, secondary components, and all of these components are different. 
but they're the same in the fact that they all deal with communication and communication ranging from placing electronic theses and dissertations online to managing a researcher's a researcher's identity in terms of ORCID, and I'm sure a lot of you here are familiar with that tool, to putting your academic specialized open journals online, to user interface content management software and more complex uh, projects that we'll get into a little bit more tomorrow. Co-locating all of these open digital components in a networked research ecosystem enables larger connections. Now that's a really important aspect. It's called a network effect. So the sum of these connections becomes greater than the parts. And that's very, very important in terms of open access and um, possibilities. Now I'm gonna move here because we're in a whirlwind tour to, a, to an article from Nature that really gives you an example of the power of open access. This is an article on dermatological classification of skin cancer with deep neural uh, networks. And it's essentially classifying um, neural networks into benign and cancerous uh, cells. You can already hear the librarian parallels, classification, metadata, labor, labeling, cataloging, and then a lot of data, which requires uh, organization or something like a data repository. Um, Tolkien or Alexander, could you press the uh, video button? Well, we're not going to see the video today, but you can go back to the um, um, uh, slides and take a look at the uh, video. But what I wanted to say about this is that combining data re centered uh, research ecosystems and artificial intelligence is a natural process for libraries because it's drawing on two facts that artificial intelligence and these ecosystems need. One is a dataverse or a data research uh, repository. And the other one has to do with classification and metadata. Two aspects that will come naturally to us in um, libraries through the institutional repository, which we've already really had the past 10 or 20 years um, work with, and the data repository, which is coming next. So here you can see an example of how the data re research repository works. This is an example of the metadata set from the previous article. It's a data set of 10,000 um, dermatoscopic images that are classified that in terms of um, cancerous uh, or non-cancerous. The, the, cl the classification is used by the AI algorithm to actually produce um, better results in terms of actually diagnosing these illnesses. And really the possibilities are um, unlimited. I don't have time today to go into some of the examples, but um, they're really incredible in terms of um, what is going on. The other potential, and I wanted to sort of highlight this, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with um, this page here. It's a dissertation uh, page from an electronic uh, thesis and dissertation uh, management system, an electronic um, PDF uh, thesis. This thesis I downloaded from Brack University in Dhaka, Bangladesh. Now, um, the, the fellows who did it actually utilized both this nature article and um, this data set to build on both the um, recipe for the algorithm that was used in the nature article and also use, using the data from the data set to improve 
the algorithm and improve the results. Now, I wanted to mention this because it's a great example of open science because it's, our, it's going across three different continents and countries, uh, North America for the original um, Nature article, Europe, and um, the Viennese doctor here, Dr. Philip Schandl, who um, uploaded all of his images on these classified uh, cells, and the students who took both the um, uh, data and the article and improved on it for the next stage of science and pro prospect of knowledge. Now, what I found fascinating about this was that libraries and library tools are at the center of this process uh, through open access. Here again is another view of um, the, uh, the thesis, but this view again is in the institutional repository that is um, DSpace. And I heard a, lot, a couple of nights ago, um, uh, one of the professors from um, Uzbekistan actually was telling me that, oh, this is one of the tools that we use here. So a lot of these tools are already in place and it's beginning to uh, take, take these tools and begin to put them together in these complex ecosystem uh, type manners to actually uh, forward the process of knowledge. So with that, um, I've given you a bit of a whirlwind tour of the possibilities of um, technology and open access and libraries um, right at the center of um, that process. And I'd like to, um, uh, I'd be happy to answer uh, questions and comments. And I've also like Matthew, um, put together a bit of a um, bibliography for you if you are interested in um, implementing uh, these types of uh, systems. And I'll be talking about the cultural heritage possibilities of these types of open access uh, technology library systems uh, tomorrow. Um, thank you. You can hear me? There we go, okay. Hello, everybody. So first thing, I am not a scholarly communications librarian. I am someone who greatly admires how they are shaping the future of academic libraries and therefore how they are impacting the work that I do do, which is the work of an academic library leader. Today, I'm gonna spend some time talking to you about um, scholarly communications from my perspective, which is a very distinctive firsthand perspective, that of an academic library director. And I think there's value in doing this at this point in time for a few reasons. Uh, first, I think it is helpful for, for any scholarly communication librarians out there um, to consider how the work that they're doing on a daily basis is shaping and influencing the work of their academic library directors. As a personal exercise, I think it's helpful for me to reflect on how scholarly communications is influencing my work. And I would say right now it is very much driving the bus uh, for academic libraries. And I think for academic library directors out there, I think it's also really helpful to give some consideration to how scholarly communications is shaping the future of libraries and therefore the work that we do. So I'm going to begin with a brief snapshot of my home institution, the Colorado School of Mines and Arthur Lakes Library. We're in the beautiful Rocky Mountain West. I encourage all of you to come and uh, visit us. We are not a large comprehensive university by any stretch. We have just over 7,000 students. Um, we are a STEM intensive high research activity institution. So we focus on science, technology, engineering, and math. Those are all of our programs. We may be modestly sized, but we do have an outsized global reputation. We, uh, we have a lot of international students and we have programs that are ranked number one globally in the world, as well as some very new and innovative programs like our space resources program that's 
mining in space uh, that has garnered a lot of international attention. But the important thing to note here is that we are a medium-sized institution, and so the size of our library is really quite modest. We just have 20 or so faculty and staff at my library, and yet we are really active in scholarly communication. So we're doing a lot with a little. Um, you know, so scholarly communications librarians and teams are really doing the daily work. What does an academic library director do anyway? And how do we help scholarly communications along? Well, you know, there's a lot of things that we do. First of all, we're direction setters. We set the strategic goals for the library collaboratively with the campus and our stakeholders. We are resource gatherers, or as I like to say, uh, we beg for dollars, literally. My job is to get the people and the money and the resources that our scholarly communications team needs to actually do their daily work. I'm a problem solver. Uh, you know, it is my job to um, navigate around any obstacles that our scholarly communications team faces. And believe me, there are plenty of them. I am a champion. Uh, it is my job to uh, advocate for the important work of our scholarly communications team and how they're contributing to the university and to celebrate their achievements. So I'm also a cheerleader, I guess you could say. Uh, I am a diplomat to the best of my ability. It is my job to represent the work of the scholarly communications team to university administrators so that we can get those resources that we need. Uh, and I think one of the most important things that a, a library director does on behalf of scholarly communications is serve as a conductor. It's extremely important that the work of scholarly communications remain integrated uh, with the very important daily work of all aspects of a library team uh, rather than being separated from it. So I'm going to take you through a quick little rapid history of scholarly communications at my modestly sized institution. And I think it's worth going through this story because each of us has a story, right? Everyone out there has a moment when they first really became aware of scholarly communications and where it was taking our, our discipline. In my case, maybe it came rather late. In August of 2016, the Colorado School of Mines hired its first scholarly communications librarian. They didn't plan to do it. It was an unexpected and opportunistic hire. So all of a sudden, with no advanced preparation, this small library found itself with a specialist talking about an entirely new area of work. And then I joined in November 2016, and I had come from small institutions. I really didn't uh, work directly with scholarly communications. So I and the entire library team and the entire campus really went into a crash course in, uh, in 2016 for scholarly communications. The first thing that we really need to, to do is I needed to learn about scholarly communications. So our SCALCOM librarian, I'll start to use that abbreviation, uh, she wrote position papers and then she and I would go to lunch and discuss them. And uh, she started an ad hoc committee on campus of key decision makers and stakeholders. She asked me to join that committee and that proved really instrumental in my ability to rapidly onboard and be able to advocate for the important work of this new librarian at our institution. Once I was on board, uh, we really needed to get the rest of the library team on board because this was new to them as well. So one of the things that I did was I organized a series of uh, campus uh, discussion sessions where, um, where everybody could come and learn about scholarly communications that was important for building campus support. But also we had our scholarly communications librarian deliver a number of in-service sessions, teaching our own library team about scholarly communications. And this was really critical because they needed to understand how SCALCOM fit into their daily work, as well as improve their ability to talk about it as they networked and moved across campus. So really, this was a period of rapid, rapid onboarding. And it also helped, all of this learning really helped us as we moved into strategic planning. So we developed a new strategic plan uh, that ran from 2017 and uh, to 2020. And it was that crash course that really enabled us to identify scholarly communications at that time as one of our six 
high-level goals. And within that high-level goal, goal five, we had three primary objectives uh, at that time. One was to really impact uh, and advance uh, the library's contribution to research at the Colorado School of Mines, enhance the visibility and impact. Two was to really dive into open scholarship and uh, provide leadership in that area. And three, we had an institutional repository, but it was modestly sized and we weren't actively contributing to it. And we really wanted to, to focus on that. And, um, you know, as a library leader, a strategic plan is your roadmap. And I really credit this to allowing us to understand at that time what we wanted to focus on. There's so much you can focus on, but you can't do it all. These were the three things we said we were going to accomplish, and this really let me uh, be that conductor, if you will. Uh, so in the early days, once we had this strategic plan, I quickly realized as a library leader, because that's the perspective of this talk, that if we were going to be successful in moving into scholarly communications, we were going to need to reorganize reorganize in a significant and deep way, uh, as well as build entirely new spaces. And um, I'll just provide one example of what we needed to do, and this was without increasing our staff at all because we're so small, uh, I needed to downsize the size of our circulation desk team uh, and we needed to create a new digitization center. So I took a circulation desk staff member and made her our digitization initiative specialist. And she was thrilled about it. It really tied in well with her background and her interests. Um, but we needed to make really dramatic changes like that. Uh, in terms of space, we didn't have a digitization lab. So we needed to uh, create one from scratch in a corner in the basement uh, so that she could do her so she could do her work. And then uh, I actually spent several years, it was quite complicated. We had to put together a series of complex sequential steps to move offices around and remodel as we went in order to open up a space in our very small library to have a center for scholarly communications. This took several years. And as a library leader, I had to plan and organize and do that. And I also had to go out and beg for the funds to make this happen. But um, we debuted our scholarly communication center in fall of 2019. And if you don't have one, I highly recommend it. There is something about co-locating the individuals active in this area in one space that will accelerate your library's initiatives because it becomes a destination. People know that's where they can go. Once we debuted that center, all of our scholarly communication services, and you know the whole menu of them, just really began uh, to take off. And I think also helping that along, besides having a destination for scholarly communications, we engaged in very intentional, intensive, marketing and advertising. Uh, librarianship is a second career for me. I was in business beforehand and I highly recommend it's not enough to be engaged in scholarly communications. You need to get out there and you need to advertise it to your campus. You need to build that awareness over time. And, um, and also we engaged in faculty relationship building. Uh, so these are some photos of our digitization lab and our scholars hub. Chris, my colleague is uh, teaching up there in the upper left. Yep, in the lower left-hand corner. Uh, so, you know, since then, of course, COVID impacted everything, as we all know. Um, but I want to say that I think COVID-19 on the whole benefited our scholarly communications initiatives because the library was ready to pivot to a totally digital learning environment. Um, but our faculty needed help, and we were there to help them with all of our uh, many efforts that are listed here today. And so while I didn't welcome the pandemic, I do have to say it was really responsible for accelerating and maturing all of our efforts. All of this is not to say that we did not have and do not continue to have challenges. I just wanna list some of the challenges that we are experiencing right now. I don't know about you, but we have a real difficulty with retaining our scholarly communications librarians. It is a hot new discipline. They have a lot of places that they can go. Uh, we have been through 
three scholarly communication librarians in three years. As a library director, I need to find a way to retain them. We have resource constraints like everybody else, uh, and that is certainly impairing our abilities to move in areas we're interested in, uh, like data uh, services that Ray talked about earlier. Um, one of the things that I'm doing a lot of thinking about now is scholarly communications needs to be diffused and integrated throughout all of the work of the library. I think we've had a lot of focus on it, but we really need to make sure that it is interwoven throughout all of the daily work of the library. And that's one of the things that I'll be focusing on going forward. And we've had unsuccessful initiatives like everyone else. I would love to have a research information management system. Um, you're not always successful the first time. Another role of a library director is to persevere until you succeed. I mentioned we've been through three librarians. There's Ya on the left, our first one, Emily Bongiovanni, who presented here in 2019, and now here is Seth. For me to retain this talent, and each of them has brought something wonderful and unique, uh, so there has actually been some benefits to the turnover, but I really need to work on increasing uh, competitive salaries for our scholarly communications librarians if we are going to be able to retain them. Um, and then just to, just to kind of remark on, there's been some real benefits and opportunities to scholarly communications to the library that goes beyond the, just the, the specialization. I think that scholarly communications has really elevated the degree of pride uh, that our library takes in the work that we do. It has definitely recast the role that we've always had, but I think the campus recognizes it more that we are integral academic partners in the research life cycle, uh, both curricular and co-curricular. Um, certainly our work in OA and OER has contributed incredibly to the affordability of our college education. So we're contributing to accessibility. We're reshaping the publishing model. And I just have to say that scholarly communications has energized the entire library across all operations. So as a library director, I, I have found that it is, has been incredibly motivating for us. It has importance and impact beyond its immediate daily work. Uh, so looking ahead again, I really want to integrate scholarly communications across all of our library operations. I would like to see the faculty who are not yet taking advantage of our services do so. I would like to scale our services into new areas like a data repository. Uh, and so we have a lot of work still to do, but the work as a library leader is, is challenging, um, but uh, it has certainly uh, been the, the driver of everything that we have been doing. And um, uh, thank you very much for your time. I'm Chris Theory. I'm the Academic Outreach Coordinator at the Arthur Lakes Library at the Colorado School of Mines in Golden, Colorado in the United States. Um, my colleagues who are listed in the program could not join us today. Carol is actually my boss. Um, in the spring 2018, we purchased an ex Libris product, Leganto. The intent was to create to the library's physical course reserves with electronic and digital library resources and make those items available through the through the campus's learning management system LM, LMS Canvas. Currently, course readings, formerly called Leganto on our campus, is considered a success, but it was not always true. This paper will discuss the Colorado School of Mines implementation of Lepganto, its initial lack of success, outside positive influences on the service, and the Lepganto revamping efforts on our campus. In February, February 2020, Lepganto was not a success at the Colorado School of Mines. Staff had doubts about the investment of money and time. Usage numbers were very small, four courses and two professors. Promotion and outreach efforts, both direct and broadly based, had yielded little interest and results. From the beginning, we were convinced that Leganto would be an integral part of learning and teaching at Minds. And prior to adding Leganto, the library had several pieces in place we believe would ensure this its success, including a successful but very small physical course reserves program, a successful direct outreach efforts to faculty members regarding library services and collections, 
and close ties with the Teaching and Learning Center on campus. It's called the Trefney Center. We were using both the Library Services Platform, or LSP, and the Discovery Interface, Alma and Primo, respectively, that were ex Libris products like Leganto. And thus, Leganto would uh, integrate seamlessly with those. And the integration of Leganto in our learning management system, LMS Canvas, um, was also pretty straightforward. As our efforts to make Leganto produce limited results, we began to reflect on what was wrong. Through time, we realized we had made some serious assumptions that led to bad results. First, we believe that combining Leganto with good pub a good publicity campaign, plus one or two well-known Minds Faculty champions would lead to natural success. Second, we tried to emulate Leganto's success stories at universities with social science and humanities focuses. Third, we thought that creating a self-help guide was good enough to assist Minds professors. And lastly, we were overly confident in our marketing and subsequent instruction sections uh, that would lead to uh, adequate usage of Leganto. Through time, we realized we were missing things regarding Leganto's success. We, minds lacked a widespread culture of course reserves. Digital resources were barely utilized. The initial participants in Leganto were from the non-STEM departments, thus we were missing large swaths of our users. Instructors did not have a, lot, a high level of comfort using our system. And sadly, sadly, there was no organic demand from the students uh, for a wider course reserves, either physical or digital. We were unaware of successful Leganto implementations, implementations at similar STEM institutions that we could implement, impl emulate. And lastly, we, the library staff, seriously underestimated how much time we would need to make Leganto a success. As we mentioned earlier, as I mentioned earlier, we reached a low point in our confidence in Leganto's success in February 2020, and then came COVID-19. The worldwide pandemic presented us limitations regarding Leganto, but also offered us opportunities. Due to Leganto's low usage numbers, we were not certain we could handle a large influx of additional course reading lists that might come from the quick switch to online learning. These fears were not realized. At the, as the Colorado School of Mines professors and students were busy figuring out the best ways to teach and learn in 2020. Many librarians were locating electronic content for faculty and students throughout 2020, but Leganto was not used to deliver these resources. Nonetheless, we remained confident that Leganto was going to play an important role in online er learning efforts. As the Minds community got more comfortable with digital tools and resources uh, due to the pandemic, in the fall of 20, uh, fall and summer of 2020, it was a cr critical time for the library staff to work together to revamp Lega our Leganto services. There were other external factors that aided in our efforts. Most importantly, in May 2019, 17, the Colorado legislature passed the Using Open Educational Resources in Higher Education Law. After an initial report requested by the statute, a, 19, a 2018 law was passed to support open education resources, or OERs, at Colorado colleges and universities providing grants, training, and conferences. And additionally, in 2021, the Colorado legislature enhanced the OER statute uh, to apply uh, statute to apply grants to develop, implement, and replicate zero textbook cost degrees and programs, and further embed OER counsel into the Colorado state government. It approached the legislature appropriated over $1 million for the 2021-22 academic year. Uh, 
And the Colorado, we've been very fortunate. The Colorado School of Mines librarians have been in the lead in these efforts, serving on statewide committees and securing over $140,000 in grants over the last four years for OERs. And these grants have been, been used in 17 disciplines, 56 courses, including 22 adoption projects and 34 creation projects. OERs have become more important uh, part of teaching and learning at Minds, especially in the last three years. And since OERs exist uh, in a digital environment, they're easy to utilize in Leganto. Throughout the summer and fall of 2020, we began to rethink how to make Leganto a success. The largest perceived barrier was the name itself, Leganto. The word meant nothing to anyone and needed explanation. After much debate, the service was renamed Course Readings. The term needed no explanation and is easy to comprehend. We began a better process of, uh, of streamlining and standardizing our procedures in order to distribute the work of Course Readings more widely within the library. We changed the way we marketed course readings to instructors. The staff realized, uh, recognized professors' legitimate concerns and frustrations and sought to break down the barriers to make course reading successful. Instead of emphasizing the system, Leganto, course readings was marketed to instructors merely as a widget in Canvas to be enabled. Instead of campus-wide announcements, Emails regarding course reserves, uh, of course, readings were sent to individually targeted professors. We worked more closely with the Minds Teaching and Learning Center, for they had more clout on campus with professors than we did. Thus, rather than having the library host meetings and training sessions regarding course readings, the Learning Center hosted the meetings and training sessions, and this led to an increase in uh, attendance. Additionally, the library switched to an e-book, e-preferred uh, when purchasing books. And that is, we would acquire the digital version of a book first. And if that were not available, only then purchase a paper copy. The library dedicated $20,000 for fiscal year 2022-23 uh, for the purchase of e-books to be used in course readings. On top of this, uh, on top of the purchasing more, e we've been purchasing more ebook packages, and it has, as a result, have increased our ebook holdings from six hundred thousand to over one million in the past two years. And these ebooks are easily uh, utilized in course readings. And lastly, we've developed a greater integration with the textbook lists from the campus bookstore and the library's collection development efforts. The integration combined with the shift to ebook purchases has resulted in greater use and acceptance of digital materials on campus. The statistics for course reading show the service increasing semester after semester. And the latest statistics we have are about from about a month ago. And they indicate for this semester that 23 departments are using course readings, 164 professors, 132 individual courses and 203 sections. And lastly, in those courses, uh, over 11,000 students have access to course readings. There remains challenges for course readings. We are only supporting a minority uh, of classes being taught at the undergraduate and graduate levels. Using course readings remains difficult in introductory or problem solving classes like calculus, physics, and chemistry, as those tend to use textbooks that are difficult to get in digital format. Our information technology IT department does not make course readings automatically available through Canvas, our learning management system. It needs to be enabled. It's a quick three-step process, but it's another thing that instructors have to do. IT decisions are often made. Uh, IT decisions are often made without our input, and sometimes have a negative impact on the library's workflows within course readings. And lastly, students are not well informed about course readings. 
course, re- the course reading service at the Colorado School of Mines is, is a success story, but it's not always been true. Overly optimistic levels of, expecta- uh, of expectations and a misunderstanding of the barriers to the project's success almost doomed course readings. While circumstances allowed the program to become more relevant, it was the efforts of the staff that played the most important role. We remain thoroughly convinced as to the usefulness and importance of course readings and are optimistic about its future growth. Through self-reflection, the ability to become more flexible and continued belief in the importance of the project, the course reading service has become an integral piece of day-to-day teaching and learning at the Colorado School of Mines. Thank you for your attention. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having us. Our talk today is about research data support at the University of Wisconsin-Madison Libraries. During the talk today, we will share a bit about the context for research data in the United States, a little bit about our local data repository landscape, a little bit about our local research data services, and then some lessons learned from our experiences. I wanna start with a brief introduction to the context in the United States regarding research data policy. We recognize that your institutions may have other pressures or obligations that you're subject to, but I hope this will help provide some insight to the current environment that we are working within and how that has informed our services as well as how we react to new policies that are emerging. Much of our current research data services and data repository options have been shaped by a memorandum from the White House's Office of Science and Technology Policy that was released in 2013. That memorandum was directed at a specific subset of federal funding agencies and required that the publications and underlying research data funded by these agencies must be publicly accessible within a certain time frame. When those agencies created and implemented their policies in response to this memorandum, many of them began to require data management plans as part of the funding proposal process. These data management plans were also required to detail where data would be made publicly available. As a very large public institution with heavy federal funding, these changes directly impacted many of our campus researchers. Our campus had a gap in researcher support for these new policies as well, so the libraries, along with um, some of our campus partners that we'll speak about throughout this talk, we collaborated to provide support for data management plans and data sharing, and we'll speak about those throughout the talk as well. Another cultural change that we've seen, and I think is pretty global, but over the past few years, there has been a sharp uptake among publishers in the U.S. toward data sharing. Many journals now require data underlying accepted publications must be made publicly available prior to publication, and in turn, we've had noticeable increase in requests from our researchers for support in sharing their data, and this has also driven increased interest and support for our work from our campus partners. Interestingly, we are experiencing another wave of change right now and are once again responding to new changes in policy from federal agencies. In January of 2023, we are seeing a new data management and sharing policy going into effect from the National Institutes of Health, or the NIH, one of our campus's largest research funders. Because this policy is much more stringent and many of our campus's principal investigators will be impacted, this policy change is drawing increased attention and demand for our services across the campus. We are having to expend more efforts to provide training and outreach to prepare our campus for this work. We are also trying to respond to and prepare for the impact of a brand new memorandum, um, also coming from the White House's Office of Science and Technology Policy, and that was released last month in August of 2022. This new memo changes public this new memo, excuse me, changes public access requirements and requires that all publications and underlying research data funded by any federal agency be immediately available without embargo, among a few other requirements as well. We won't fully know how this will impact us until each agency releases its specific policies, but we do know that this will continue to shape our strategies and near-term goals for the next few years. In light of this policy landscape that continues to expand expectations around research data sharing, we are striving to come up with solutions that will support the majority of our campus researchers, as well as identifying areas of need that we might be able to expand into in the future. Due to this, we have multiple repository options for our campus researchers. 
The first that I'll talk about is Minds at UW. This is our open access institutional repository. This repository actually predates the policies I spoke about earlier and was built somewhere around 2008. We use DSpace, which is an open source software and a ready to go software for repositories. There are companies who do provide hosting and support for DSpace, but we host and support it ourselves locally here. We do use this repository for all scholarly outputs, so we'll take research data, publications, and other objects. The structure of DSpace also allows researchers to have a landing page for their department or their lab, and then multiple collections for ob um, objects or scholarly outputs within that. Anecdotally, we have seen an interesting increase recently in researchers who want to share data through Minds at UW, as opposed to the many other repository options that are available. Because our uh, campus has a large number of researchers producing large quantities of research, Search data and Minds at UW worked best for smaller data, we identified a local need to help researchers share data on the scale of a couple hundred gigabytes to up to one terabyte for publications. Due to this, we have been working with the Research Cyber Infrastructure Office in our Central Information Technology Division to, su to pilot supporting this need. We leverage their data storage infrastructure and a tool called Globus. The item records and metadata are discoverable through Minds at UW, but the data is linked out to and then accessible for download and use through Globus. This slide shows an example of that here. Um, progress on this work has been a little slower than we would have liked due to the limited resource resources we currently have, but we are excited to be able to offer this for our researchers. We are also currently working on road mapping the next few years of our repository and where we'd like to grow into. Um, so with that, we're identifying areas of growth, areas of critical need, and working with our um, campus partners and research cyber infrastructure to identify opportunities for further improvements that we can complete during our pilot agreement for this Globus work. The next option is a third party open data repository called Dryad. You may be familiar with them, but if not, they are a trusted repository that we've been recommending to our researchers for a very long time. They recently released a new membership model that has been an affordable way for us to scale data sharing support and provide more robust infrastructure. Through our membership, we have unlimited deposits of up to 300 gigs, uh, gigabytes per deposit for our researchers. Dryad provides a number of features, including robust storage and preservation infrastructure, minimal curation of deposited data sets, integrations with publishers, and the ability for deposited software and scripts to get automatically pushed to another repository called Zenodo that specializes in that work. This has been a really great option for us because a large swath of our campus um, has scientific data. And so they can make use of this on demand without contacting us. So we are always happy to help them, of course. Even with Minds at UW and Dryad as options on our campus, we do still have gaps in data sharing support. And so we end up helping researchers identify other repositories that suit their data needs. One example is a repository called ICPSR. This is a great repository resource for our researchers with social science data or social science methodologies, especially those with human subjects data or semi-sensitive data as it provides different restriction levels for their deposited data. ICPSR does have a member model, but it also does charge upfront costs for data curation in order for researchers to be able to make their deposited data fully publicly accessible. So while I think we'll be recommending this repository more frequently for data funded by the National Institutes of Health policy that I uh, spoke about earlier, um, we are having to do a lot of outreach um, right now to plant the seed that researchers will need to consider these data sharing and curation costs more carefully and also be sure to include them in the budgets of their research proposals when they submit for funding. We also wanted to share some brief lessons that we've learned from our experiences. So to run through them quickly, the first we have is to be responsible responsive to the pressures and environment of your researchers and campus. We've had to adjust our services or pilot new options based on the needs we see as we encounter them. We also recommend planning for growth of your repository at the outset. So if you were to get a lot of demand from your campus, would your storage or service model scale well? We also recommend using the repository model that makes the most sense for your needs. As you can see, we've used a couple of different options that help us meet capacity in different use cases. We also recommend working with other campus groups to address policies and gaps on campus if 
you can. Unless you have a lot of funding, people, and resources available for your data repository, partnering with other campus services is a great way to share infrastructure and share support for your services. It also allows each partner to do what they do best rather than trying to do it all on your own. Finally, one area that I'd really like us to be able to put more resources or more effort into is outreach to our campus research. I think we could have more impact on supporting data management plans and research proposals, as well as more strategically collect research data for the repository if we were able to conduct more consistent and targeted outreach to our campus. However, good outreach requires a lot of sustained effort, so one day I would love to be able to have an individual in our unit who could take on outreach as part of their role. And now I'll pass it to my colleague Jennifer to talk about research data services. Hello, my name is Jennifer Bethenio, and I am the Data and Digital Scholarship Librarian at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. In addition to providing support for researchers sharing their data and scholarship in our minds at UW Repository, I'm also a member of the Research Data Services team. Research Data Services is an interdisciplinary group of experts from across the university that provides support for researchers and their data management needs. Our services include assistance in the form of education and training for labs and classrooms and best practices for data management and reproducibility. We also offer training modules on data management basics on our website, and we cover uh, data management planning tips such as, um, and in our materials, we cover data management planning tips such as assessing whether the data can be shared, planning for the size and types of data that will be produced, how the data will be stored and organized, including file naming practices and folder hierarchy structures, uh, documentation of data, including standards and metadata, mm -hmm. Uh, the importance of creating backups, and planning how the data will be shared or preserved. Uh, we also share examples of reproducible research tools, such as Git for version control and Markdown for reproducible reports. Another service that we offer includes consultations, both one-on-one -on -one with researchers and with labs. During these consultations, we often assess data management needs and offer recommendations, as well as guide researchers to useful campus resources where appropriate. And lastly, we offer assistance with data management plans. Creating data management plans is a good practice for researchers in general, but many funders require researchers to write detailed data management plans to ensure that the, their data will be protected and properly cared for at all stages of the research project. We offer to review these plans before they are submitted to the funder with their grant application and help ensure that they meet funder requirements as well as any legal and university requirements. We found that this is especially helpful for researchers because it can be difficult for them to keep up with changing funder requirements or to know which resources at the university will help them meet those, um, those specific requirements. In terms of reviewing data management plans, uh, there is a free tool that we like to use called DMP tool. Uh, it has templates available for many of the most common funders, which make it easier for researchers to write plans that will meet those requirements um, for, uh, for specific grants. It also has the opportunity for researchers to create a data management plan with a general template. Uh, once researchers write the draft of their plan, they can request feedback uh, and we will get a notification uh, at Research Data Services that lets us know if we have a plan to review. Uh, we then provide our suggestions and, and comments through the tool. Uh, DMP tool um, is a really great tool that uh, allows us to provide support quickly and efficiently. Uh, we also um, created a learning module on our website called uh, Intro to DMP Tool to help researchers get comfortable using it. Our research data services team draws expertise from all over the university. Uh, this allows us to leverage the expertise of our colleagues uh, and partners to help researchers across the life cycle of the project. Um, members of our team include librarians with expertise in data management, outreach, instruction, and subject area expertise in data curation, the humanities, science, and engineering, the health sciences, social sciences, and geospatial data. We also have members of RDS who come from the research uh, cyber infrastructure initiative on campus. They have expertise in research information, technology and infrastructure support, research computing, uh, including cloud computing, and solutions for storage, backup, and internal data sharing. We also have members of our team that come from the university's data science hub, which provides support for training in computer science and data science. Uh, they provide expertise in data science facilitation, instruction, project support, um, and help with machine learning. Our group meets once a month where we share knowledge uh, and keep each other informed of updates in each of our areas. Together, uh, we have formed a referral network so that when we get questions from researchers, we can make sure that we are directing them to the person who will best be able to provide them with the support. Um, so we get questions through the contact form on our RDS website and we don't know the answer, we can reach out to the rest of the group and someone within our network will know. 
Uh, we also all collaborate together on outreach. Outreach is an important part of our efforts with research data services. It is critical for us to get uh, information about our services, resources, and updates uh, and funder requirements to researchers at the point of need so that um, so that we don't get any surprises down the line and that researchers don't get any surprises either. So just keeping keeping each other informed. Um, we want to make sure that we're talking to our researchers as early in the project as possible so that they have what they need to be compliant with their requirements and uh, to manage their data from the beginning. It's also important for us to do outreach to students so that they know about the data management skills that, that they need to be successful in their projects. Some of the ways that we do outreach include tabling at, at student events, creating flyers about our services uh, through a, a blog on our website, a regular digest um, that we send out and uh, through social media like Twitter and through organizing events. Through uh, the partnerships that we've been able to build with research data services, we have um, had the opportunity to collaborate on a couple of projects such as the Data Storage Finder, uh, the Researcher Toolkit and a membership with Dryad, which was a joint effort between the Department of Information Technology and the libraries. Uh, the Data Storage Finder is a tool that RDS created that is um, Available on our website, it asks uh, researchers a series of questions about their project needs, uh, their research data, and any regulatory compliance needs. Based on their answers, the tool rec recommends a data storage solution available on campus. Um, so we built this tool uh, collaboratively to make it easier for researchers to parse through the storage options available to them and find the best solution. The Researcher Toolkit is another project that we collaborated on. Uh, this is a guide for UW-Madison. Uh, faculty, staff, uh, and student researchers that points to helpful resources for each phase of their research project. Uh, information about the resources available to researchers on campus can be spread out and difficult to navigate. Um, so the researcher toolkit collects all of this information in one place and presents it in a way that makes it easier uh, for researchers to understand. So I will end with some of the lessons we learned through our work with research data services. Uh, data management needs can vary widely across disciplines and even throughout the stages of a project. One person uh, cannot possibly know everything or be an expert in all aspects, so it's really important to connect with others who have different areas of expertise. Um, and a collaborative approach has given us the best results. Uh, in building a referral network uh, with colleagues across campus, we've been able to uh, become a useful first point of contact for researchers looking for support. Um, and so uh, another thing that's been beneficial is uh, tracking and discussing the needs that we come across at our meetings. Um, this has allowed us to see where, can, where we can expand our services and where there might be gaps. Uh, and some of our ideas for projects have come out of that. Uh, we've also developed strategies for keeping our costs low. Where possible, we rely on free or nominal cost services and tools. Uh, we also partner with other campus units to share costs for uh, support and infrastructure. And lastly, uh, collaborating on, on projects with other campus units has helped us to make uh, sure that uh, the time and effort that we invest in creating resources will be of the greatest benefit to the largest uh, number of people. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is still Yashar Tonta. I'm, I'm honored to be uh, with you as part of the celebration of the International Open Access Week. Thank you for the invitation. As you all know, the main theme of uh, the International Open Access Week this year is open for climate justice. The last year's theme was also related with uh, justice and equity. Justice, equity, and equality draw attention in recent years in terms of getting access to knowledge. The Equity of access to COVID-19 vaccination is also a big issue. More than two thirds of the population of high income countries have been fully vaccinated so far, whereas less than 5% of low income countries did so. 
open access, uh, open for climate justice, this is the theme. Uh, just as in the um, access to the vaccination, COVID vaccination, there is a rift of climate justice between rich and poor, women and men, and older and younger people. Openness can help reduce this gap considerably. Today, I am going to talk about how open access and open science can help tackle grand challenges such as COVID and the climate crisis. More specifically, I'm going to talk about how open access speeded up the process of developing vaccines against COVID pandemic and finding a cure there too. The publisher Oxford University Press chose the word vax as the word of the year for 2021 because 2021 was an unprecedented year in, in that scientists all over the world worked hard to develop the COVID-19 vaccine. What you see in this slide is the time it took to develop vaccines against various infectious diseases in the history of the humankind. Twenty twenty one was an unprecedented year uh, because scientists developed vaccines. Yes, more than one vaccines uh, for an infectious disease is in less than a year for the first time in the history, less than a year. What you see in this slide is the comparative open access rates for papers on COVID-19 and other diseases. Thanks to the publishers opening up for their COVID related papers and the data to the use of all scientists. As I said earlier, it took less than a year to develop the vaccine. As this slide shows, over 90% of all COVID related papers were accessible during this uh, period. This was unprecedented because open access rates for papers on other diseases were much lower, which prolonged the process of finding a cure for those diseases. Immediate and full sharing of new scientific evidence could play a decisive role in contrasting outbreaks of infectious diseases. The case in point is the vaccine against the Ebola virus. The Ebola virus outbreak in uh, Liberia in 1982 remained hidden to some public health uh, institutions because the paper reporting this information was published in a subscription journal, in a paywalled journal. A more timely dissemination of this study would likely have led to faster and more effective actions to reduce the scale of the epidemics that occurred later on in 2014. This brings us to the fact that scientific knowledge should be considered as a commons. Eleanor Ostrom, who was the first Nobel Prize winning woman uh, economist, did pioneering work on how to manage the common resources. You see, up until Professor Ostrom's work, it is believed that Common, uh, common resources such as pastures, water resources, fishing rights, etc., can easily be exhausted because everybody wants to benefit most from those common resources. However, Professor Ostrom showed that this was not the case and common resources can be governed effectively as well. And her work on this topic uh, earned her a Nobel Prize. She later wrote a book on knowledge as a commons, as you see on the right, hand, uh, right hand side of the uh, screen. Um, knowledge as a commons, um, as Ostrom defined it, um, whether its value is dim diminished when used and whether its use can be. Um, 
restricted to a certain person or, or a group. This is called subtractability. Uh, for example, my benefiting from useful knowledge, like learning the Kazakh language, will not diminish the value of somebody else's learning the same language. Ostrom classified resources based on these two axes, subtractability and excludability as seen in this slide. For instance, foreign language learning is low on subtractability and difficult to exclude others from learning foreign languages. Contrary to physical resources, my use of digital resources will not diminish their value to others. Yet, it's easy to exclude others because of the licensing mechanisms that are in place today, even though sharing digital resources will in no way reduce either the amount or the value of them. This must be changed if we wish to accelerate the process of finding vaccines against infectious diseases or find solutions to grand challenges such as the climate crisis. Luis Pasteur was the first to acknowledge the crucial importance of knowledge as being a commons, although he didn't use the word commons that's open to everyone. He said, science knows no bounds because knowledge belongs to humanity and it is the torch that illuminates the world. The reason why science is not open to everyone is that scientific output such as papers, data, etc., became a lucrative industry, especially within the last 30 years. Scientific publishers make more than 25 billion US dollars annually of, of scientific papers, which they neither funded nor paid for the salaries of researchers who carry out research or for the quality usually done by the very same researchers completely free of charge. Yet they put these publications behind the paywalls or impose embargoes, which prevent the very same researchers from accessing them. This slows down the whole scientific process. If you are further interested in this topic, please take a look at the documentary film called Paywall, readily available from the address uh, on the screen. Several studies show that the existing intellectual property rights are detrimental to the process of scientific development and innovation. Intellectual property rights reduce the scientific research and product development about 30%. IPR curtails the knowledge use and innovation uh, creation because the traditional intellectual property rights are based on copying, hindering the use of digital information because in the printed world, uh, copying uh, is a right uh, for them, for the authors. How should intellectual property rights work for digital commons like scientific knowledge and inventions? that can be shared with others without diminishing their value and are not restricted to the use of a particular group. Due in large part to existing intellectual property rights, we are in what's called a vicious circle. Many scientists and institutions cannot afford to provide all the scientific resources because of their high licensing costs. This is called the affordability crisis. The publishing industry is also slow to incorporate digital developments. For instance, the publishing process can be speeded up by opening up the reviewing process, e.g. open reviewing or post-print reviewing data and reuse. This is called the functionality crisis. Moreover, paywalled process also created what's called uh, the replication crisis, as it is difficult to replicate the findings when the publications, the data and methods are not open to everyone. OA, uh, open access through uh, transformative agreements. Um, recently, there is an intense debate 
about the feasibility of increasing access to scientific literature through transformative agreements. These are contracts negotiated between publishers and institutions combining subscription access to journals with the possibility of open access publishing and uh, shifting costs from authors to institutions. Hybrid gold and trans transformative open access provides additional revenues to publishers. It's worth noting that the green road um, has three fundamental advantages over the transformative agreements. Firstly, it doesn't risk increasing the costs that, would, that should be paid by institutions to publishers, which is a, a concern for countries with limited financial research support. Secondly, it doesn't su suffer from the uncertainties and latency of negotiation processes. And thirdly, the green road poses no equity problem, whereas transformative agreements can be more or less advantageous depending on the negotiating strength of uh, institutions or their consortia with the publishers. Getting back to the role of open access, helping tackle grant challenges. In 2019, just two years before the word VAX was selected as the word of the year by the Oxford University Press. The word of the year was climate emergency. According to the World Economic Forum's Global Risks Report of 2022, people identify climate-related issues and biodiversity losses due to the climate crisis are seeing the most severe risks over the next 10, uh, 10 years. Interestingly, this, the very same people see the climate crisis as the most severe risk in the next zero to two years and two to five years as well. Yet we did almost nothing within the last three years to confront the climate emergency problem. Climate emergency is one of the, what's called wicked problems. Wicked problems are those problems that are complex to define, let alone to solve them. I am aware of the economic and political pressures regarding reducing temperature. I am aware of the right to pollute the air and it's trading over the years. Uh, for example, less polluting, polluting countries selling their polluting rights to more pollute, polluting countries. But despite the existing inequities in getting access to the vaccine, if we were able to find a vaccine against COVID virus in less than a year, we can also take immediate measures against the looming climate crisis. I think one of the things we must do and we can do relatively easily is to embrace the need for radical change. We can embrace open science consisting of open access, open data, open source software, open infrastructure, open reviewing, open licensing, etc. before it is too late. Thank you for your attention. Nazar Nazar Ahmed. Hello there. My name is Kathleen Shearer, and I'm the executive director of CORE, which is the Confederation of Open Access Repositories. Um, thank you very much for inviting me, and happy Open Access Week to everyone. Um, the theme of Open Access Week this year is open for climate justice. And I'd like to explain to you in my presentation today why I think repositories are critical for supporting open access and open science as we move forward and um, scale up the open science practices around the world. Um, CORE is an international association. We are um, 
a global repository network um, with um, over 150 members and partners from around the world in, in over 50 countries. And um, we do a number of things, including advocating for repositories, but also ensuring that repositories are interoperable. So we define interoperability standards and we look at what are the, is the future role of repositories and how can we get there from where we are now. So um, fundamentally, research has two aspects, a local and a global aspect. And of course, we very much know that research is global. Um, if you look at a map of the Giant, which is the high-speed network, you can see the high-speed networks around the world are connected to, um, to each other and er connect every region. And that's because researchers need to share information and data with each other to be able to support advancement of global knowledge in many different areas. And of course, um, we are becoming more and more acutely aware that many of the world's most challenging problems must be <clears throat> addressed at the global level. And of course, climate change is one of the biggest problems that is facing our societies now. Um, uh, we are feeling the impacts of climate change in every country, in every region. But the cause of that climate change is not necessarily because of actions that are happening locally. So everybody really needs to address this problem to be able to solve this problem everywhere. Um, COVID-19 is another very timely example of the need for rapid information and uh, sharing across the research community at the global level. As um, the Director General of the World Health Organization says, COVID-19 will not be over anywhere until it's over everywhere. And we've seen very much um, with the advent of the COVID-19 pandemic, how open science practices um, can really help to accelerate the development of solutions for um, a global problem. And um, because researchers were sharing their preprints, their data, publications were made immediately and openly available to the world. We saw, the ex we saw how quickly um, vaccines were developed, how other um, uh, challenges around COVID-19 were addressed in different regions and that information was widely shared in a very open way. But the other aspect of research that's very important to remember is that it can be also very local. There are a lot of um, problems that we have with in different that we have in different uh, countries that are, are local problems and may not be relevant to the global research community. Um, those problems may be related to a specific ecosystem, to a specific culture, and those problems or those research priorities are also very important to be supported by the research communications infrastructure. And um, in addition to that, we also know that most research is funded by tax payers dollars and it's very important and there's an increasing recognition that um, the language that in which research is published is a barrier for access by those local populations to the research they fund because there's an incentive for researchers to publish in English. So there's a movement now to, to um, try to ensure that research can now be published not only in English so that other researchers can read it from around the world, but also in the local language so that um, the public has access to that research. So I think it's important to remember that we want, not only do we want to support openness in scholarly communications and research outputs, but we want to support bibliodiversity and bibliodiversity refers to um, different workflows, different languages, different types of publication outputs, 
different research topics. So our global system must support diversity as well as openness. But the challenge really is how do we support these two different aspects of the research communication system? One whereby we can share information and data widely across the whole international infrastructure and one where we can support the advancement and publication and dissemination of other local priorities, needs and research types. And this is very much the kind of thing that we are looking to do at core, create a global knowledge commons based on an interoperable network of open access repositories. And it's very important to remember that those repositories can support local needs while maintaining a certain level of interoperability that would allow them to be nodes in an international network. And if we are to achieve this, we can support the needs of researchers who want now increasingly to have this interoperable um, ecosystem um, that contains a variety of digital research objects that can be searched and text and data mined that are open to everyone and that recognize a variety of contributions from around the world. So um, for us, and I think it's, it's obvious that in order to be able to support this, we need a global network of repositories that are interoperable and local at the same time. And this is very much, um, this vision is now being supported and advanced um, by a number of governments around the world. And what they're realizing is that um, researchers are not incentivized to contribute and to share their variety of research outputs because they are being assessed by a very narrow set of factors based on journal publications. So how many articles are they publishing or is a researcher publishing in what venues and how prestigious is that journal title and how many citations do they get? And this is really a disincentive for um, scaling up the open science ecosystem. So there are a number of, of initiatives that are happening, and I think Europe is probably the farthest ahead to try to change the research assessment system to respect and recognize a diversity of research outputs and contributions um, by the researchers. And this is something that very much also underlines um, the UNESCO recommendation for open science, which talks about the need for local infrastructures to be able to support local needs um, and connecting those local infrastructures together through an interoperable network. And the open science recommendation provides a framework for national policies in order to advance open science at the national level, but they're very concerned with supporting a diversity of researchers to ensuring that open science is inclusive for all researchers and all regions and countries, and that we can support um, multilingualism and other local research priorities. So as I mentioned earlier, repositories are key for advancing these, these new visions around creating a diverse um, and equitable ecosystem for open science. There are already at least 6,000 open science repositories around the world. And again, this our vision is very much based on the need for a large number of repositories to be very distributed to support the diverse needs of different research communities. 
So we do not want to have one big repository that Saul that is available for everyone. We want to ensure that there's a diversity of repository systems across the global landscape. Of course, these repositories need to be open and they need to be open for researchers to be able to access the content in repositories and all, um, and, and all researchers should also have access to be able to deposit into repository. It needs to be open um, in that way. And we also need to ensure that we use open licensing and as much as possible use open source infrastructure to ensure the sustainability um, of the uh, research platforms moving forward. We want to create an inclusive system where all researchers have access and all repositories are um, participating and one that is trusted. And so these it's very important that these repositories are based at research institutions and universities around the world. And we need interoperability. So these repositories cannot act in silos. They need to be interoperable with each other. Each repository needs to be a node on the international um, and global network of, um, of repositories. Also critically, we don't want to integrate too many services into the repositories because that takes them away from broad level interoperability. So in order to advance this vision, CORE has been really working through individual repositories, but very much through regional and national networks of repositories. So we work in Canada, in, in um, Latin America, in Europe, we work through open air, um, Africa, Asia, and um, Australasia. And through our national networks, we try to work with um, the repository communities to adopt good practices, to ensure interoperability, and to advance the new behaviors and functionality that we need to be able to support this vision of a global knowledge commons. So in conclusion, uh, thank you very much again for inviting me. Investing in a repository is investing in pub your published publish public research infrastructure. So we encourage you very much to um, consider the importance of repositories at your local institution and the need to have that repository um, interoperable and engaging with the national repository network in your country and internationally at the global level. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So let me start with my presentation with a poster from Elsevier that never underestimate the importance of a librarian. So let me define open access for, uh, re for review. Um, it's providing free access and it should be digital. It's online and free of charge and free of most copyright and licensing restrictions. Also, it removes barriers, price barriers and permission barriers. Then we have here that um, open access is not synonymous with um, universal access, and we need to address at least four kinds of barriers. For the definition of an open access contribution, there should be an active commitment, and librarians are in the position to do that. And it also um, includes a lot of contributions that could be a result from research, um, including data and source materials and others. Also, if last um, clarified its position on open access, and I'll, I'll leave you to read that. Uh, and recently, they, they re just released the 10 year of IFLA open access statement, a call for action. Also, uh, the, the UNESCO provided us um, the OA mandates and declarations. So you can have the file. And let me highlight the OA serves the inter interest of many groups. And I would like to highlight the libraries. Okay, so OA solves the pricing crisis and it also uh, solves the permission crisis and serves the library interest in other indirect ways. Librarians want to help users find the information they need 
especially that almost all libraries have budget limitations and the librarians also can help their faculty increase their audience and impact and help the university in general to raise its research profile through the repository. So here are some resources for open access. And this knowledge that mentions, this um, presents the technology drivers, national R&D system, the challenges, institutional framework, communities of researchers, researchers, and the societal expectations. Okay, let me start with the predatory publishing. So some of you are familiar with Bill and he, produ um, he produced a list of uh, dubious and bogus scholarly open access journals. And here's the list and it's now archived. And here's our, here are some news in India about fake science on one journal to 1,500 in 10 years. And Hyderabad is a hub of pay and publish. So um, there are also uh, reports on 40 countries and million articles were produced on that. And um, BL, Bill's uh, recommendation is, are we, should open access journals be banned? But librarians and universities can educate your faculty and researchers and should in, exclude fake journals from your catalogs. Okay. Also, India um, addressed that problem by crackdown and um, on predatory publishers and investigated on that to address the shady journals. It's not only in India, but it's worldwide. Pakistan had a problem, China also, and Iran. Okay? These are published in this uh, paper on, uh, by Amin Zargami. Okay, so the proliferation of um, predator journal is unstoppable and we just need some regulation. You need, we need to give value to quality over quantity. We need to prevent many unethical behaviors to decrease the value of um, predatory journals. Also, there, could, um, there are cases that there are hijacked journals. For example, this one is from the Philippines, but the address is already located in Seychelles. Uh, next issue is on reproducibility. So some of you are familiar with uh, Dr. Wan Singh on um, studies on related to um, nutrition and food. And these are some of his findings that people eat more when they are served in large bowls and people gr who grocery shop hungry by more calories, etc. cetera. And I, it, it was found out that there are shoddy data in his studies and it, some of his publications were retracted. A total of some more were retracted and a total of 16. And Cornell University made a statement and it, upon investigation, they found that misreporting of research data, problematic statistical techniques, failure to properly document and preserve research results, and inappropriate authorship. So he tendered this resignation. So there's a credibility um, crisis now in food science because of that. Now, next is on plagiarism. It's presenting the words of others or ideas of someone else as your own without proper source or acknowledgement of the source. So here is... Um, um, infographics related to the different um, schemes on um, plagiarism and libra librarians can help their users to um, avoid um, getting to uh, plagiarizing text. For example, these are texts from my students and um, we ran in Eternitin and we found out some similarity index. And currently we're developing in the university where I'm now connected we call it wired plus plus uh, IR and electronic dissertation and thesis. And the dilemma is that plagiarism checker should be plagiarism check should be done before the thesis is deposited or before it was defended. But there are cases that there might be cases that previous thesis and dissertations we can unearth plagiarized text for previous thesis and dissertations. So here are some plagiarism software and tools, and also some open access tools and sites that you can use as, and promote to your users. Now, let me proceed to the digital contents and digital library and IR. And this is my proposed framework that libraries, archives, and museums can um, curate digital contents and resources, which is needed in an information society, um, which, is, which, which could result to improve governance and sustainable development.
So the IRs were identified to be an important and primary tools in the open access movement. And here are some um, manifesto by IFLA and UNESCO and um, definition of IR. And here are the four IR um, essential elements identified by Proser and Crow. Um, listed below are some of the uses of institutional repository. I will not um, get into that details, but I'll discuss to you our experience on developing the repository. So this is the CIFDEC institutional, AQD institutional repository or SAIR, and we developed that using this space. And this is the screenshot of all um, the, the, the development for 10 years. So it's, we started from scratch and without budget, and support from the management came after. So the communities in Sair, and we also customized. We have a Facebook chat added here, Messenger. And also you can have the export citation. We can have, you can share it in your social media. And also we included an ORCID um, integration for all our authors so that we, it will appear like this. And we have added scopus citation, dimensions, altmetrics, and plumex to include also altmetrics um, indicators. Also, we included ASFA vocabulary and um, agrovoc, so that when you search your um, keywords, then uh, it will suggest from that um, uh, vocabulary. So for the performance and impacts, we targeted 20 million searches performed by 2020, but because of COVID, we achieved that by August 2020, we already achieved 20, 20 million. And by August 2021, we reached double of that, 42 million searches performed with only a few publications like 1,900 1, downloadable PDFs. So how did we do that? Um, let me share to you that we only have 31 items or one item per year, a per day archive in the repository and 300,000. So the the map shows um, the IP addresses that access our repository, and we found a, a worldwide uh, um, access. So here's the latest. Um, I cannot play the video for now, but I would like to share to you some um, top 10 downloads. Here are the download um, because of there's a readily available PDF that you can download. And here are some of the top 10 most viewed items. And um, we try we try to target that search results would be on the top ten in Google search um, search results, and looking at the number of visitors from um, CIFDEC member countries, you will find that also in the Philippines, which is paying our um, paid by our um, government for our operation and salary, and looking at the number of devices, you can find that in 2019. Um, it almost doubled uh, for the mobile users. However, during the pandemic in 2020 and 2021, there's a return of desktop and laptops during that time. So if you look at the visitors and unique visitors, we jumped from April, which is on the peak of uh, the, the, um, uh, the pandemic. Uh, I mean, the um, so we have an increase from 5,000 to 50,000. That's almost 1,000 percent increase to up to 98,000. So, and because of copyright restrictions from published articles, we added a request copy button. So this is the default of the D space, but we added um, customized, wherein you can type in your address, your user type, and you can also parse email request. And we can find a, a data of um, those requesting for those articles and we have a download key generator for that that expires in a few days like seven days so this is an example of an article where you can request this document and um, you just put in um, encode your your name uh, your email etc and we will respond to you at least in one to two days and the library will receive articles from a high school student from a college student and also here are some of uh, the screenshots of how they share that on the social media and that um, we um, found an increase of requests during the pandemic 
uh, some of the teachers were looking for um, textbook, uh, textbooks or materials that they can use in school. And last is um, this one, we received that in email and we reply one by one. So we received in 2018, 4,600 article requests and 1,800 during the pandemic in 2020 and 2021, 1,359, okay? And we tried to categorize the group if it's under uh, graduate college or academic institutions, we found that it's students and faculty who are downloading our article, are requesting our articles, and mostly from um, from the Philippines also. And here, um, sorry, um, this is a world map of the distribution of the institutions that request. And this one is the we try to map the request. And also for the word cloud, here are some of. The, key, the words that they use for the purpose of why they would like to request it. And most of them are for research, for reference, and for their thesis. And um, this is my IT guy, and it's the only one doing that. And take note, he's also a colorblind person. Um, here, so that's why we have press releases that we boost open access to aquaculture and fisheries, and that digital and thousands of materials are freely downloadable in our repository. In terms of collaboration, we are a member of IMSLIC, IUD, uh, and UN, uh, FAO. So for interlibrary loan, for those we don't have a subscription, we can borrow from Stanford, from um, NOAA, from Cicero, uh, University of Rhode Islands, and other universities. And we're the first and the only Asian to participate in the Z3950 broadcast search of catalogs. However, the, the, the Z3950 um, expired um, in 2019. So what we did also is we, we merged the two repositories, the Aquatic Commons and the Ocean Docs, and we developed the Aquadocs during my term as IAMS League president. And this is to, um, to avoid duplication of effort from lab volunteer librarians. So we deposited our um, repository, our records there, and now we're into dealing with open ASFA by the FAO. Now, also, we discussed that online during the pandemic, and we're a member of the IUDE as Associate Information Unit, complementing the Associate Data Unit of IUDE. Now, for IMC Digital Fisheries Library Box, we use the Library Box technology, and we're the first in Asia to use this in fisheries. Um, this doesn't need a data and internet connection. So there are 26,000 PDFs that um, is broadcasted through a, 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 through a Wi-Fi signal and users can download through their mobile phones, their laptops by connecting to that Wi-Fi connection. Okay, so for the last, um, for the last slides, sorry. Uh, so this is our proposal to have developed the, the CRIS and um, for the future plan, here and um, we plan to deposit also in ocean best practices and in uh, OBIS. Thank you. Добрый день, уважаемые коллеги. Благодарю Министерство науки и образования Республики Казахстан, Ассоциацию библиотек вузов Республики Казахстан и библиотеку Назарбаев Университет за приглашение принять участие в 11-й Евразийской конференции академических библиотек. Библиотека, которую я представляю, одна из крупнейших в России, государственная, публичная, научно-техническая библиотека Сибирского отделения Российской Академии Наук, совсем недавно ответила, отметила свой вековой юбилей. В 23 году ей исполнится 105 лет. Столетняя история библиотеки, ее создания, превращения, передвижения значительной части литературы на восток страны и практически нового рождения библиотеки в Сибири поистине уникальна. Возникнув по распоряжению Высшего Совета Народного Хозяйства 17 июня 1918 года, Государственная научно-техническая и экономическая библиотека первоначально была одной из многих ей подобных. Тем не менее, уже в первые годы деятельности она смогла увеличить свои изначально небольшие фонды, фонды более того, приросла многими известными книжными коллекциями того времени. Помимо роста книгохранилища, быстрому развитию библиотеки способствовало деятельное и неординарное руководство разных по масштабу деятельности организаторов, ученых, уникальных личностей, творцов науки и культуры, политиков, государственников. 
Энергия Горбунова, Ипатьева, Яковлева и других первых в списке директоров позволила вывести библиотеку из числа прочих, поначалу превратив ее в крупную, а затем в центральную библиотеку советской промышленности. И в конечном итоге в действенный рычаг реформирования библиотечного дела в стране. Первый период деятельности стал для библиотеки временем наращивания ресурсов библиотечных, кадровых, научно-исследовательских, управленческих, образовательных, этапом испытания на прочность, сосредоточением сил, средств и информационных возможностей. Период индустриального общественного подъема второй половины XX века и научно-технического прогресса потребовал создания мощного научного центра за Уралом, Сибирского отделения Академии наук СССР. А это, в свою очередь, повлекло за собой необходимость основания здесь крупного информационного подразделения – мощной научной библиотеки. Основатели Сибирского отделения Российской Академии наук, академики Лаврентьев и Христианович, настаивали на перемещении на восток страны уже сформированного фонда научной литературы. Поэтому на уровне руководства страной было принято решение – в 1958 году на базе Государственной научной библиотеки Министерства высшего образования создать две государственные публичные научно-технические библиотеки – ГПНТБ СССР в Москве в составе Государственного научно-технического комитета, комитета при Совете министров СССР и ГПНТБ СУРАН в Новосибирске при Сибирском отделении Академии наук СССР. И по итогам постановления – 17 октября 1958 года в Новосибирск предписывалось перевести две трети книжных фондов ГНБ, что составляло более трех миллионов томов литературы. Перемещение таких богатств, книжных богатств, через всю страну само по себе было уникальным явлением в мировой практике библиотечного дела. По железной дороге в Сибирь стали поступать тысячи и тысячи книг, Сюда же был переадресован и бесплатный обязательный экземпляр книжной палаты. Направлялась и новая иностранная литература. Одновременно в Новосибирске велось строительство девяти этажей крупнейшего библиотечного здания на востоке страны, открытие которого для читателей состоялось 17 октября 1966 года. Библиотека начала сибирскую эру своего исторического пути – год за годом наращивая масштабы своей деятельности, в том числе и научно-исследовательской. За шесть с половиной десятков лет э, сибирского существования библиотека превратилась в крупнейший научно-исследовательский, информационный, образовательный, культурный, просветительский центр. Здесь регулярно проводятся научные мероприятия, лекции, презентации, экскурсии, семинары и так далее – Современникам стали привычными креативные научные и научно-популярные мероприятия. Библиотека задумывалась как научно-исследовательский институт, который работал в первую очередь на интересы Сибирского отделения Российской академии наук. В уставе записано, что ГПНТБ – это научно-исследовательский институт. Поэтому и сегодня библиотека продолжает расширять свою научно-исследовательскую и научно-организационную работу в области истории и современного состояния книги, книжной культуры, библиографии, издательского дела, медиалогии, изучения книжных собраний, проблемы хранения, выявления потребностей и предпочтений читателей, пользователей, медиапотребителей, развития библиотечно-информационных технологий, поиска инновационных форм работы библиотек, определение их роли в условиях цифровой трансформации общества и многое другое. Первая научная конференция по проблемам развития библиотечного дела Сибири и Дальнего Востока была проведена в библиотеке 55 лет назад, в октябре 1966 года. С тех пор традиция больших научных форумов не прерывалась. Ежегодное масштабное научное событие по актуальным вопросам библиотековедения, библиографоведения и книговедения стало визитной карточкой ГПНТБ «Суран». Проходившая в марте этого года традиционная международная научно-практическая конференция «Либвей-22» открыла серию юбилейных мероприятий 65-летия Сибирского отделения Российской академии наук, в ряду которых были и другие значимые научные события, 
проведение выставки презентации книг, изданных институтами СУРАН, открытие мемориальных библиотек академиков и международной научно-практической конференции «Личные книжные собрания и архивы в фондах библиотек». В 21 веке ГБНТБ «Суран» удерживает позицию одного из крупнейших информационно-библиотечных центров страны, реализуя свою миссию сохранения и развития универсального фонда знаний для будущих поколений, обеспечения свободного и равного доступа пользователям научно-образовательного комплекса Сибири к важнейшим информационным ресурсам. В настоящее время научные работники – Научные сотрудники работают над шестью научно-исследовательскими программами, каждый из которых по-своему специфичен. Одна из тем – трансформация книжной культуры в социальных коммуникациях в XIX-XXI веках. Она реализуется в лаборатории книговедения, и целью этого проекта является выявление и анализ закономерности трансформации книжной культуры – коммуникациях 19-21 веков, анализ эволюции книжной культуры России, ее тенденций в условиях как раз модификации коммуникации в различные исторические периоды позволит определить направление изменения ее важнейших институтов – книгоиздания, книгораспространения, библиотек и чтения. Книжная культура никогда не существовала в отрыве от общества, и, с одной стороны, она отражала – изменения самого общества, а с другой стороны, конечно же, влияло и на общество в том числе. Другое научное подразделение ГПНТБ «Суран» – лаборатория информационно-системного анализа, занимается разработкой терминологического ряда метрик и критериев эффективности взаимодействия научно-исследовательских институтов и общества, оценкой отношения науки – коммуникативной деятельности и общественности к науке, динамикой его изменений под влиянием различных событий, развитием теоретико-методологического обоснования направлений библиотечно-библиографической деятельности как канала взаимодействия науки и общества. Научно-исследовательский проект на тему «Разработка модели функционирования научной библиотеки в информационной экосистеме открытой науки» реализует отдел научных исследований открытой науки. Конечной целью данного проекта НИР должно стать построение модели функционирования научной библиотеки, создание, содействие созданию эффективной информационно-коммуникативной инфраструктуры при, для поддержки открытой науки. Есть и другие проекты, один из них, который продолжается уже в течение многих-многих лет. Его ведет отдел редких книг и рукописей. Он называется «Депозитарий книжных памятников Сибири и Дальнего Востока. Выявление системы цифрового хранения и организации доступа для исследования». Целью проекта является обеспечение доступности к научно-достоверной и максимально полной информации о хранящихся в сибирском и дальневосточных регионах книжных памятников в процессе их выявления и изучения. Важным научным результатом достижения цели проекта станет введение в научный оборот новых памятников и целых коллекций книжной э, литературы стариобряческого или официально церковного происхождения. Новизна проекта в том, что в научный обиход, в исследовательскую среду вводятся книжные памятники, не являющиеся экземплярами государственного хранения. И эти книжные памятники то же самое сканируются, они становятся доступны пользователям. То есть это огромный проект, который продолжается уже не один десяток лет и ведется в том числе и сегодня. ГПНТБ продолжает развивать международные связи, активно взаимодействие с зарубежными информационно-библиотечными учреждениями еще с конца 60-х годов XX -го века. За последние десятилетия библиотека подписала соглашение о сотрудничестве в области информационно-библиотечной деятельности, культуры и науки с научными и научно-техническими учреждениями из 32 стран мира. Издание научных сборников и трудов, монографий и научных журналов «Библиосфера» с 2005 и «Труды ГПНТБ Солан» с 2019 наследует еще одну традицию научно-исследовательской деятельности учреждения – знакомить современников с широчайшим спектром задач, 
решаемых библиотекой в интересах всестороннего расширения библиотечно-коммуникационных исследований. Библиотека бережно сохраняет свои традиции, меняясь вместе с технологиями и оставаясь при этом самим собой. Дорогие коллеги, благодарю за внимание и желаю всем успешной работы, новых прекрасных достижений и профессиональных успехов всем участникам 11-й Евразийской конференции академических библиотек. Спасибо за внимание. And um, especially to our distinguished speakers, my fellow librarians, and to the organizers of EALC, congratulations. So I would like to start it with the idea that knowledge is no longer shelved. Scientists and scholars, as a tradition of scholarship, publish the research free of charge for the main reason of sharing the output of their scholarly endeavors, which has been our discussion, discussion the whole day. So I will just wanted to quote um, this uh, part of the um, idea from Spark Europe that even the best ideas remain just that until they are shared, until they can be utilized by others. The more people that can access and build upon the latest research, the more valuable that research becomes and the more likely We are to benefit as a society, more eyes make for smaller problems. Um, so I just have briefly summarized my presentation this afternoon, more of an application of all the concepts that had been discussed the whole day today. So one, I'll be providing an overview of open access agenda in the Czech Academy of Sciences. Second, I'll just describe the projects at the Oriental Institute where output resources, methods, and tools are publicly accessible in digital format with no or minimal restriction. And lastly, um, share an assumption on how the library shapes the future of open access activities from my perspective at the Oriental Institute. Okay. <clears throat> Just a small uh, background about where I work and what is our institute. So the Oriental Institute was founded in 1922 and is one of Europe's oldest institutions dedicated to studying the politics, societies, and cultures of the Orient. Um, from the organizational structure, we are under the umbrella of the Czech Academy of Sciences Um, a research institution, uh, a network of 54 member research institution. I just wanted to highlight that we are a research institute, not an academic library, an academic institution, but as I see the connection that research is always an important component of academic libraries. Um, I'm sharing some of the projects that we are doing Um, so just a bit about the library very quickly. Uh, the general library was established in um, nine years after the Institute has been developed, almost uh, nine, um, 91 years ago. We have um, also special collections, um, the Luson Library, um, the Tibetan collections, the Korean collections, and um, the John King Fairbank Library. So we, are, we have a very diverse collection, which is composed of 300,000 volumes of um, books, manuscripts, and other um, oriental materials. <clears throat> so being a research institute, the value of openness is indispensable for us. The more people that can access and build upon the latest research, the more valuable that our research becomes and the more likely we are to benefit as a society. So with that, um, the concept, I'm just sharing the concept of open access. 
um, as connected to the realm of global research community. Um, this beehive represents the facets of open science and open science involves various movements, including open access, as you can see in our, um, which is the core of, of this um, a topic. Um, in the Czech Republic, specifically the Academy of Sciences, the practice primarily works within these three concepts, um, uh, open access, open data, and uh, open air. So this is our structure. Um, but today I will just be highlighting the one that we're doing um, at the Oriental Institute when it comes to open access um, for all, for those who are practicing open science and uh, geared towards open science and open knowledge practices. We all know that open data is also an essential component. And uh, the simple principle behind this is that in data sharing, we want it to be as open as possible, but as closed as necessary. Um, but nonetheless, I will just be focusing on the summary of the open access resources and projects that we have at the Institute. Okay. Uh, yeah, for the purpose of this presentation, I will expound my idea on open access projects, as I've mentioned. So the first one is um, the Monuments of Mosul. This project was created in response to the serious threat to Mosul architecture by the terrorist organizations, Islamic State or the ISIS, which controlled the city uh, from 2014 to 2017. So this project was created um, with a framework developed by experts in the field in a good baseline data for possible legitimate replication uh, working within the following areas. One is um, tracking of the destruction in Mosul through satellite imagery analysis. Second, there's if you go to the website, you will see an architectural and historical analysis of destroyed monuments through extant pictorials and planned documentation. Uh, there are also several projects on that. The third is the creation of three-dimensional virtual models of monuments for which we have preserved sufficient quality documentation. And last is the analysis of ideological background of the dis, dis, uh, destructions. <clears throat> so the project team published a database of the most important results of this research, where you can find a complete catalog of uh, Mosul's destroyed monuments, this is just a screenshot of it, the satellite image, an extensive map application with an interactive map of the destroyed historical core of Mosul in G system, uh, as I mentioned, the three-dimensional model and documentations which are also uh, open access and can be downloaded for those who are interested to focus on this um, uh, research. So this is the website where you can go to. The next one that I wanted to share to everyone is uh, the Taiwan Biographical Database or what we call as Tibayo. Tibayo is a graph database combining six data sets amounting to approximately 19,000 personal entries. It is envisioned as an open platform for researchers to use and contribute with their own data sets. So this is where linking of data and sharing of data are, are, are working together. So this um, platform offers a number of analytical instruments which can be freely adapted to support investigations at the intersection of history, sociology, literary history, and digital humanities. I'm just showing the mapping of semantic categories. Um, unfortunately, I can't show the video for this, but um, you can go to the website as I put it in the presentation. <clears throat> so, Tebayo as a tool allows users to systematically correlate commonalities in the lives of individuals with each uh, other, such as um, birth, education, occupation, family background, etc. Okay, um, 
I'm not sure if I could do the presentation now. No, okay. We'll see how it works. Okay, so I think this works. So this is a good example. Um, yeah, very quick, few seconds. So that's that's the content of it. If you wanted to analyze it, part of it could be downloaded or you can contact us. You can integrate some of the data for the platform. There's the timeline visualization. Um, there are all the data of the networks. So you can see how families um, and ontologies are connected with each other. Um, so that's, that's how it is. I guess I'll just skip that. <clears throat> Another project we have is the Persian Tadkhira project, which devoted to exploring trends in the production and circulation of uh, biographical anthologies of Persian poets produced across Persianate world from 20, 1200 to 1900. The major aim is to understand how the macro level trends in the production and circulation of this particular genre can help elucidate shifting levels of transregional interconnectivity in the Persianate world across space and time. Let me see if I could show the presentation here. Okay, no, okay. So as I mentioned, this is a, a transregional library that serves a as a repository of accessible and circulating text meant to be incorporated, reworked, and re repackaged by cater of authors separated by time and space. So you can see like this is already the visualization, but the raw data is available for researchers. I know in Nazarbayev University, there are also some uh, scholars in humanities who are doing Persian studies. Okay. Um, <clears throat> This is just an example of the citation analysis that has been done within the platform. If you wanted to know more, the explanation behind the infrastructures, um, you can discuss with me. Um, I, can, I can show you how it worked and what are the frameworks done. Uh, the last thing, which is very, very interesting, if you are, um, we wanted to learn more about Tibetan language, is the trilingual online dictionary, which is publicly accessible source for translation from Tibetan into English and Czech and vice versa. You might be more concerned only in Tibetan and English. So we also have the, the Wiley transliteration. If you try to notice, there's the uh, Tibetan um, transliteration or, or text. Um, or um, characters here. <clears throat> Aside from these projects, we also have open access materials that everyone can share with us or you, you might be interested to use, especially the first one, the open access copies of the Oriental Institute publications. This is a Scopus Index publication um, available in, in various platforms, but the earlier copies from 1929 to 2010 uh, can be accessed uh, free of charge. There's another one in Czech language, um, which is called the Novi Orient. It was published during the socialist period and it's used to provide the general, uh, the general public with well-founded and interesting, interesting snapshots of the Czechoslovak um, culture during that time. Last but not the least, you will be able to see also in our um, uh, digital library, some of the rare books uh, which, are, which we are digitizing. Until now, we are still doing this project. So uh, just quickly, I have three minutes more. Um, librarians' role in open access. I just wanted to highlight that uh, where do librarians fit in? Uh, a while ago, we had been discussing about um, um, transformative agreement as a way to advocate for open access, leveraging uh, OA publication through consortia. We are also doing that as libraries in uh, Czech Republic, specifically my library. We are also helping scholars digi in digitization and self-archiving of research uh, for open access materials, not just for resources, but also for the data. Uh, 
We also help develop advanced search and ontology based metadata works. And of course, data curation and ultimately the preservation. Future directions, I just wanted to make it very quick. So the potential of openness becomes more pervasive with sharing of outputs at different stages of their maturation and combined with continually updating data, simulations and visualizations, as well as commentary and interpretation. Open access will become the default, at least for many disciplines, increasingly developing within a broader context of open science or open research, where network level content venues are likely to transform the dissemination increasingly personalized retrieval agents that will transform discovery. Um, for us, uh, our uh, direction is that OA will always be evolving, as we all know. So Oriental studies, like other fields of humanities and um, social science will continue to work within these transformations as knowledge is meant not to be merely shelved. Thank you so much, Spasiba Bolshoi.